Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Leadership Purpose with Dr. Robin podcast. I'm so glad you're here and you're listening to the podcast. I say it all the time and I will continue to say it all the time. I really appreciate you for listening in. And because you listen in, we have been ranked in the top five podcasts of all podcasts globally, according to listennotes.com. So thank you so much for doing that. And if you would go ahead and subscribe, rate, review to the podcast to help us keep it going. All right. Now I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Now today I'm talking with Lori Marcus. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Lori. Lori Marcus is a speaker, coach, author, and independent board director and board advisor. She's the founder of Courtyard Connections, LLC, which is an advisory firm focused on marketing and leadership. She's worked with PepsiCo, the Children's Place Retail Stores, Keurig, Peloton, Harvest Business Schools, and so many more. She is a sought after keynote speaker, for her signature talk entitled, Train for the Career and Life You Desire. And the focus there is helping women reach their full potential. And she's a founding member of the Band of Sisters, which is a group of former PepsiCo executives. And they speak to Fortune 500 companies about all aspects of diversity, equity, inclusion, and leadership. And they have a book that you can get. And their book is entitled... <laughs> You Should Smile More, How to Dismantle Gender Bias in the Workplace. And the last thing I want to say about <laughs> Lori Marcus is she uses her passion for fitness and wellness in her mentoring and coaching and in her signature framework, Everything I Need to Know, I Learned at Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Lori Marcus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Robin. I'm so glad you're here. And I'm looking forward to this conversation because we were talking so much before. And now we actually get to let people in yeah. on the conversation. So you heard me talk about your your sort of formal introduction. We couldn't encapsulate everything you've done. But yeah. Give people a picture of what you do. So tell us in your own words, whatever you want to tell us first about yourself. And then secondly, about your work. Yeah. So first about myself, I live in the uh, Metro New York area. I am a health and uh, kind of a health and fitness nut. You know, you can find me at 6 a.m. most mornings, either running outside or in my basement on my Peloton. Um, I'm also, I've been married for 34 years and I'm the mother of two uh, wonderful women who are now in their twenties. And, um, and so that's just a little bit about about me personally. Um, let me interrupt. Let me just interrupt and say congratulations on <laughs> Thank you. Thank your you. marriage success. Because to <laughs> yes. me, I mean, you don't hear that all the time. So I can only imagine that the commitment it took. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Well, it's, a, you know, it's a commitment. And, um, and then the other thing is, it's a commitment when you're in a you know, dual career, both of you working full time, trying to raise your children, uh, my husband's an academic, but he's also done consulting. Um, I, you know, I traveled a lot for work. And so it's just, you know, I give props to everybody who make it look easy, but you know, there's, it's just, it's real teamwork. It's real teamwork. And it's also, I would say a privilege. Like I said, my daughters are now in their twenties. Um, They're both professionals. And it's also a privilege to get to the point where, your children, you're not really raising them anymore. You know, they're fully launched. And if you're lucky enough that they still enjoy spending time with you and, you know, they want to be with you because they want to, not because they have to, and you've common interests, like that's a blessing. Like I, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not grateful for that, not just for their health and the fact that they're, you know, terrific people, but also that they choose willingly to spend time uh, with me and with my husband. So that's, like I said, a, a blessing every day, every day. Sounds um, like you, you all, both of you figured it out with the marriage and with the children. <laughs> we're, we're, you're always working at it, right? You're never done. You're never done. Um, 
And so, so that's kind of personally, and then professionally, I, um, just cause I like things organized, I tend to describe my career in three, three easy chapters. So the first chapter was, you know, corporate America, most of that spent at PepsiCo, but really kind of academy consumer products or CPG as people call it. And, you know, pretty much everything you can do mostly while working at PepsiCo, I was there for 24 years in, you know, every facet of marketing and general management. So that was my chapter one. Then I had a chapter two as a chief marketing officer, and that was really more in the retail and direct to consumer area. So that's really where I got a taste for direct to consumer e-commerce and what people would call kind of more modern digital marketing. And that was a wonderful five years. Came with a lot of personal sacrifices because I commuted to New Jersey and Boston and lower Manhattan. That's a topic for another day. So that was my chapter two, a C-suite executive. And then my chapter three has been a really wonderful, call it um, seven, almost eight years now um, as a, you know, in a portfolio career. And there, because everything has to be threes, you know, I do three things in my portfolio career. I serve on corporate boards, public and private. Um, I do executive coaching, um, largely with a company in New York called Crenshaw Associates. Um, and then the third pillar is we're out on the book and the speaking tour with the band of sisters for our book, You Should Smile More, which is about dismantling gender bias in the workplace. So it's a really nice, again, three chapters, each one which informed the next. Um, and I feel very fortunate. I always say having a robust portfolio year, portfolio career is kind of a reward for all those years slogging it away like one company at a time commuting to crazy places traveling all the time it's a privilege then to sort of choose what you do and who you want to do it with yes and is that and for people who are maybe in earlier aspects of their career or on their journey this notion of portfolio career tell say a little more about that yeah. So you think about it in your earlier days. I mean, now entrepreneurship is much more kind of fashionable and in vogue, but you know, when I was growing up, I came from very humble beginnings. Like my dad coached us. I was one of two daughters. I think in hindsight, I realize now my dad was kind of a big feminist and he was very much about like, get a job. You don't want to be dependent on anyone, man, woman, or otherwise to support you. You have to support yourself. And um, it was very much of like, you go work for a company because that's what people do. And you get paid via like a paycheck every two weeks, like a W-2 kind of job job as we call it. And that's all I knew. Um, and so, like I said, I did that, you know, forever for 35 years. A portfolio career is really where you do, you know, I say I'm self-employed now, you do a number of different things. So in my case, it's board work, executive coaching, and the book tour. But for some people, it's, you know, it's consulting. It might be um, being an adjunct professor someplace. It might be being a part-time executive in residence at a private equity firm. It could be any number of things. And usually by definition of portfolio means it's more than one thing. And usually it means someone isn't paying you like a W-2. You're putting together a group of things. What I would say to this group is the learning for me is I never thought about a portfolio career. I just assumed I would work as a W-2 employee until I was 65, and then maybe I would retire. And I think now, you know, please God, we're all living longer. We're living longer and more vital lives. I think it's wonderful to think about that one option is to work as a W-2 employee for somebody else. But there's a whole other chapter that you can have. It doesn't mean you have to be an entrepreneur and start a company and go make something and get funding and sell it. It means that you can do a portfolio of things, some really within your area of expertise and some that could be new things for you. So it's wonderful to think that whether it's in your 50s, 60s, 70s or beyond, that we, we all have the opportunity to do different things. I love that. And I love that because it's something that I don't hear from guests, you know, typically on the podcast. And I just feel, I just had a sense that it, somebody just had an aha moment. I hope just so. Had an aha moment to say, hey, I don't have to do one thing. I can yes. do you do multiple things. Yeah. And the yeah. only, I know you didn't ask for advice, but the only like advice that I would give people is, and I didn't do this by the way, is you should think of one should think about 
their portfolio career or their next, next career while they're still at their first career. We tend to think about, well, I'll do this thing until, you know, I'm financially secure, um, that I don't have to do this anymore. But I think a portfolio, I was very fortunate I'm somebody that, you know, knows a lot of people. I have no problem getting out there, pounding the pavement, and I made it happen. But it would have been a lot smarter to start making it happen. If you know the relay race metaphor, right? Like in a relay race, you run side by side with the person and then you do the handoff. You don't start from a standing start, right? It would be a good idea, I think, for people to think about while they're in their 40s, what is it they might want to do in their 50s, maybe when they have a little bit more financial security, or, you know, in my case, we had two children. Um, we didn't have trust funds, no one had paid for my children to go to college. So, you know, we were, uh, we were big savers. But at some point, when you have a little bit more financial flexibility, I just think there's something really smart about thinking about that chapter before you're actually in that chapter. And there are connections that you can make. There's learning that you can do while you're still in your chapter two, thinking about and planting seeds for your chapter three. So that was a learning for me and hopefully a learning for your listeners. Yeah, it's. I believe it is. I believe it is. And because you've broken down what you've been talking about in chapters, that makes me think of your book. So let's let's go yeah. there next. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let's talk about your book. Tell us anything you want. Tell us anything you want to say. I'll tell the title again. Then you could say maybe the main idea, how it came to yeah. be, anything you want to talk about it. And the title again, and this will be in the show show notes. You should smile more. How to dismantle gender bias in the workplace. So tell yeah. us what you want to say about the book. Yeah. So the book is basically about um, kind of the mic, we call them micro moments. Some people call it micro bias. You've probably heard the term microaggressions. It's not about, you know, God forbid the Jeffrey Epstein or the Harvey Weinstein me too moments. There's a lot, you know, written about that. And that's not really our area of expertise. Our book is about the, and this is what our keynote is about as well. It's about the little things, the little tiny things. They happen one by one by one. They happen every day. They pretty much happen in every meeting. And they're just, it's it's unconscious bias, but it's unconscious bias in the form of unconscious gender bias. And it's little things like telling women to smile more or asking women to take the notes or doing office work, like planning the parties or Women are talking in a meeting and they kind of get talked over, talked over. They say an idea, people get talked over. And then five minutes later, a guy says the same thing. We'll call him Greg. And everyone's like, great idea, Greg. So it's these little things that one by one by one, they don't seem like a big deal. If you bring them up, you kind of sound like a jerk. But over time, what happens is they're like bricks in a wall. And so two things happens. One is either women get exhausted by this. It happens all the time. No one's doing it intentionally. I don't believe people are waking up in the morning saying, I'm going to hold women back by asking them to take the notes in the meetings and plan the parties and do the non-value, you know, non-promotable work. I really don't believe that, but it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, so either women get exhausted by it and they kind of check out or worse yet, women get marginalized. So when you say something like, oh, we just hired a new girl in accounting, you don't automatically think, girl, I bet she'll be the next CEO, right? You would never say, we just hired a new boy in accounting. I mean, you can't do it, right? You you laugh if you try and say it, we just hired a new boy out of Yale. You can't do it. You can't say it without doing a spit take. So the point is these little things one by one don't seem like a lot. They add up over time and they marginalize women. And so the book and our, our, our speaking is all about making everybody, men, women, people of all genders aware of these issues. And then what you can say or do in the moment, after the moment, before the next moment, as a woman who experiences this, as an ally or a witness of any gender and as a leader of any gender. And what I would say is it's very practical. There's a lot written about unconscious bias we found there was very little practical application about what to do about it. So we don't just opine on the problem and kind of look at it. It's like, 
Okay, literally. So when you're in a meeting and someone says, oh, we just hired this uh, this new girl in accounting, what you can literally say or do, again, as a woman, ally of any gender, leader of any gender. And so it's very, very practical. Yeah, and it sounds very valuable too. Yeah, to have, yeah. You know, a handbook of sorts, especially exactly. that we moved away from the awareness phase because we had did, you know, there was a long time people weren't aware. So a lot of the yeah. books, focusing on just bringing awareness and yes. now we're moving on to application. Yes. Yes. And we're, we're operators by background. I mean, those of us who wrote the book together, we met years ago at PepsiCo, but we're, you know, we're P&L owners. We're operators. We're not academics. We love academics. We cite a lot of their research in our book, but it, like I said, it's not just kind of studying the problem. It's okay. What can you literally say or do? One other thing I'll say about the book is because we wrote it, there were actually six of us who wrote it together. There isn't one answer in any given moment. So, um, you know, versus if you read a book by one author, it's typically that author telling you what he or she thinks you should do about a particular issue. In our case, what we recognize is depending on who you are, your ability to use humor, your level of psychological safety, kind of, you know, where you are in the meeting, in your career, different approaches will apply. And so just like if you remember from years ago when Sex in the City was on and people say like, are you a Charlotte or you were a Miranda? Part of what people tell us about the book is it's not like they have to always identify with Lori or C or Katie. It's like sometimes, oh, I love what Lori said about this. Oh, I love how Katie, I love the Katie advice in that particular situation. And so you can kind of pick and choose what you think would work, like I said, with any situation in you know, any particular moment or company. Yeah, it sounds like it's very helpful to have that sort of variety of voices yes. in there. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so you said you wrote it with, you know, there's six of you all together. Yeah, yeah. So how did that come to be? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it was nowhere on my, uh, you know, bucket list or bingo card in 2019 to write a book with five former PepsiCo executives. And the quick story is it came together very organically we're actually at a very small dinner with Indra Nui, who had just retired as the CEO and chair of the board of PepsiCo. And, you know, she's, you know, renowned in probably in all industries, but she led PepsiCo for a long time. And we're at a dinner with her. And I don't know how we got on the topic of how I, Lori, was one of the um, founding members of the first ever Women's Resource Network at Pepsi back in 1993. Oh, wow. And um, and parenthetically, I will tell you, I mean, it was before I had children. I think I probably assumed we would start the Women's Resource Network. We would fix all the issues. Women would achieve parity in pay and all of that. There would be no gender bias. And then someday I would have children. Uh, if I had, you know, uh, girls, they would become young women. They would graduate. They would go into the workforce and we would have solved it all. Check. And of course, what happened was here it is 2019, we're having this conversation. My younger daughter was just about to graduate from college. And as we were at this dinner talking about the Women's Resource Network and some of the moments that we felt at work, not just at Pepsi, but you know, Pepsi's PepsiCo is an unbelievable company, but at other places and even on my boards, these little moments where you felt like you just didn't fully belong and you couldn't bring your full self to work. I had this moment, it was a real aha, and I have to say, I'm gonna get a little upset, a moment of profound sadness when I realized my second of two daughters was about to graduate from college into the workforce and we hadn't fixed it. Like here it was like, you know, almost 30 years prior, I had started this women's resource network with the intention to, you know, fix it, make it better. And we hadn't fixed it. And so it was just a moment we started talking at that dinner and after and after about how could we use our voices, our power, our position to actually not just, you know, complain about the problem, but maybe do something about it. So we started writing and talking and going out, we kind of just did a little speaking circuit and it resonated more than I can tell you. We're at a conference this summer of 2019. And I joke that like, we couldn't get off the stage. People are like, one more question, one more question, one more question. And I'm like, I'm not Oprah. Like, why are, why are they so interested in what we have to say as the answer? But pe people were so hungry for this content 
And then, like I said, we started, we thought we were going to speak about it. A little pandemic happened. So we said, it was actually C, my colleague, she said, let's just flip the order. Instead of speaking for years and maybe someday we'll write a book while we're stuck in our home for the quote unquote next couple of months, joke, joke, with this pandemic, why don't we write the book? And then when the pandemic ends, then we'll go out and we'll speak. So pandemic lasted a little bit longer than we all thought. We were able to finish our book, publish our book. And then, like I said, published it at the uh, September of 2022. And we've been out for the past couple of years um, speaking at corporations, large and small, all over the country. I love that. And good for you and good for coming yeah. together. It's a good model for people who want to get together with a group of yes. uh, what you call a band of sisters, their <laughs> colleagues, their friends who have yeah. a like mind and passion for a particular thing they want to do or uh -huh. cause or message. Yeah. So here, I this is my curiosity just popping in here. When I, see, I imagine you on your tours talking about the book, how does that happen? Are you in a panel? Do you each like, how does that work? Yeah, so we do what we call kind of a multi-voice uh, keynote. And so usually there's, you know, three or four of us, you know, sometimes five, depending on the size of the audience. You know, we speak to large audiences, sometimes 700,000 people. So, um, we, you know, we often bring several of us, but um, we do sort of a, like a self-orchestrated, it looks very spontaneous. I would say it's fa fairly planned out. We do a lot of storytelling. We use a lot of humor, a lot of banter back and forth, but it's sort of, I always say, if you're looking at the stage, you swear it's going to be a panel, but it's really a multi-voice keynote a lot of Q and A and, um, and we share our stories because we're marketers by background. We have clever names for things. We have clever illustrations. I mean, we kind of can't help ourselves, but part of that honestly is we're not, um, we're not content hogs. Like our intention is the language that we use, which is really shorthand to name something. Like I said, you know, great idea, Greg, before is, or Susan, will you take the notes? We want people to use that language so that they can use it as a shorthand in everyday conversation. So if you remember from like Seinfeld, you know, from years ago, there's that notion of a close talker. When I say close talker, everyone knows what it is because of Seinfeld, right? So we do that sometimes we'll be in our, we have our weekly meetings and one of us will say something and maybe someone steps over them and kind of repeats it. And someone will literally say, did you just great idea, Greg, me? And it's like, oh yes. And so it's just sort of instant. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to use a lot of words. So we really encourage people to kind of take the vernacular that we use and, um, and 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 bring it into their workplace and conversation so that we can start to have more and more progress. Our goal is in every conversation, in every meeting, more people are aware of these little, again, these subtle kind of micro moments or microaggressions. And then over time, what happens is you just start to have less of them because people are aware and in their head, People of all genders are saying, oh, instead of saying things like, she's just not a good fit or she's too emotional, they just take the little 10 second pause and they say, would I say that for a man? And you just think to yourself, if I wouldn't say it about a man, let me just think for a second before I say it about a woman. So we bring that all to life. Like I said, lots of, you know, um, uh, you know, lots of Q and A and people bring very, um, I, I, I love this. People bring a lot of vulnerability when they come to our talks, whether it's at a conference like Sherm or whether it's at a corporation and they bring a lot of vulnerability with their questions and their stories and real life examples of, you know, maybe where they felt kind of, uh, a little burdened by gender bias and they'll um, ask our point of view, or maybe where they felt that they had some opportunity, men, women, person of any gender, that they'll stand up because we speak to audience, multi-gender audiences, and people will say, hey, this is, you know, something that, you know, I was in a meeting, I said this, I'm curious how you might, how I might have handled that better. And so it's wonderful. You walk away every time thinking, oh my goodness, we made a real impact in people's lives. And then hopefully they're going to take it back to their workplaces and kind of pay it forward. Yeah. Because not only do they have the awareness and the application, they also have the language 
yes language yes and easy yes. to use and learn and remember language that they could exactly use immediately so that's wonderful yes yeah, it is. And and one other thing I would say on that, Robin, is when we first started speaking, we were speaking largely to women's resource networks and ERGs and largely um, uh, audiences that were all women. And, you know, it's wonderful. You know, women, they, they love, they feel validated. They love that we give language and we give practical tools. And it was one of our earliest um, presentations. We were at uh, actually a PepsiCo event and there was a sponsor of one of the women's groups in the back of the room. And he said to um, my friend who was producing the event, he said, um, I need to take this back to my leadership team. He's like, men need to be in the room and men need to hear this. And we really pivoted. That was two years ago. And ever since then, we speak largely to audiences with people of all genders in it. We really try and like um, invite men into the conversation um, and you have to practically have men as part of the solution because just mathematically you say who's in the C-suite of most corporations, who are the CEOs of most corporations, who are the majority of board members, the majority of private equity investors, funding companies. It's largely men. It's largely white men. Just mathematically, that's not a value statement. It's just, it's just a fact. And so you have to bring men in to raise their awareness and bring them into the conversation and into the solution. And I will tell you, Robin, I think one of the things that resonates most with people is we're not, it's, there's no cancel culture with us. We're not trying to catch people like, oh, you said you called your girl. You can't call somebody a girl. You're canceled. It's not about that. It's about awareness. It's about, you know, thinking about things and you're, you know, you're working at a weekend event. We had a a uh, friend of a you know, sort of a friend of the family who said he was at a weekend event. He had two very senior people working for him. They they have a lot of weekend work in what they do. And he was just about to ask the woman who has two small children at home. She's standing next to her male colleague who also has two small children at home. And he was just about to make pleasant conversation and ask the woman who's watching your kids this weekend. And he just had that little moment where he said, wait. I like I either should ask both of them or neither of them because by me just asking her I'm kind of othering her and it was such a simple thing but we get these stories of allyship and impact all the time where people say oh I get what you're talking about like suppressing microaggressions is just little micro actions yeah. little things that I could say or do or not say or not do and I didn't add another brick to that woman's wall that day. Yeah. So it's so simple and easy. It's not like we always say like, poor Mayor Pete, he has to fix the whole infrastructure of the whole com country. Like, oh God, that's a lot of work. Dismantling gender bias, you can literally do it in bite-sized pieces every day in every conversation. Yes, one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. One bite at a time. Exactly. All, all right. So, I mean, there's such valuable... Uh, <laughs> strategies and awareness for people who are listening. Now, speaking of people who are listening, let me tell you who I think is listening. And yeah. the podcast is for what I call high achieving women. Yeah. Women who are responsible, ambitious in a positive way, mm -hmm. goal oriented. Uh, they are good at a couple things. They are the ones that in their professional lives, people come to them and ask them questions you know, want to pick their brain or want their advice, whether it's about something they do or not. Yeah. <laughs> and in their home life, in their personal life, whether it's family, friends, neighbors, community, whether organizations they're in, people tend to come to them. They're the one that yes. come to for advice, or just want to pick their brain. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're always supporting other people mm -hmm. because they have this and they're okay with that. But then I thought, well, who supports them while they're supporting everyone else? So when I was thinking about yes. the podcast, I thought, well, this would be an opportunity for us to talk to each other. Yeah. And then a couple of seasons into the podcast, I thought, you know, there are some people who fit that description who are also saying, I'm at a point in my career where I feel like there's more. I don't have that sense of purpose in my work. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I, I don't feel like it's a meaningful uh, work for me to do right now. And what mm -hmm. what is this thing? There's something missing. So then I thought, okay. Now we can also talk to that, to yes. that particular issue. So with all that in mind, yeah, to the question of 
with that person who's saying, you know, everything's okay on paper. Mm -hmm. I just don't have any real connection to the work anymore. I don't feel it's like in connect in line with my purpose, whatever that mm -hmm. is, I'm not making a meaningful contribution. What's something from your array of yeah. experience and expertise, any area of your life or work, would you say yeah. to the woman that I just described? Yeah. So you mentioned um, uh, earlier, there's a signature talk that I do. It's called Train for the Career and Life You Desire. I actually wrote it when I was at Keurig and I've given it since. And it's three quick parts. And I'll get to the part that resonates for this. It's basically, it's about integrated work-life planning. So it's about taking the same rigor that you take for doing a strategic plan or an annual operating plan um, at work and using that to integrate your life and work together. The second part is about the importance of health and wellness and fitness, sort of my version of the corporate athlete, if you're familiar with that great work that Dr. Jim Lair and others have done. And then the third part is how to use what you do in your, I'll call it corporate, but it doesn't have to be corporate per se, um, how to use what you do in your corporate role to make a meaningful impact on society. And so I want to focus on that third pillar today. So quick story, I had always, I have, I struggled with what you were saying, I think every day since I graduated from college, I grew up in modest means. I, um, I just always thought, um, again, I was very fortunate. I worked for Nielsen Marketing Research right out of college. And then I went to work for PepsiCo a few years out. PepsiCo is an amazing company. They train amazing leaders. I can't say enough good things about the company. I spent 24 years there. And, but I always struggled with it. I literally would say to people, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, like would they say at my funeral that I led the marketing team to convince Applebee's to switch from Coke to Pepsi? Like, is that really what I want to be known for? And there's not a day that went by that I didn't think about it. And I thought, gosh, you know, we, I came from modest means, we, you know, we didn't have family money or anything like that. So I can't go run a nonprofit or do that. I live in, you know, Fairfield County, Connecticut. It's expensive to raise children here. And so I was like, okay, at some point I'll keep doing this like consumer products thing. And then when we have enough money saved, then I'll go run a not for profit and do something that matters. That was a hundred percent the band that was playing in my head. Fast forward, I don't know, it's probably, I don't know, call it a decade or more into my career at Pepsi and someone in the industry had invited me to a, like a little offsite and it was women who were basically presidents and CEOs of restaurant chains. I was at the part of Pepsi where we called on uh, food service and hospitality customers and this wonderful woman in the industry invited me to attend. And we went around the room and people were talking about legacy. And this was such... I can I remember it like it was yesterday. It was early 2000s. So this was more than 20 years ago. And what I learned that day was there's probably, there's probably more, but there's probably three different ways of thinking about legacy. So one woman who at the time was the president of a major seafood chain, she actually had a legacy coach and she was working with that coach. I love this idea of what her legacy was going to be. And in that case, because the company relied on the oceans for their living, she started, I'm going to get this only half right, but started a foundation within the company. They were very involved in environmental causes. Again, this is 20 years ago before environmental causes were kind of in vogue. And it was very much, um, she was going to use her seat and her power to do something that really mattered, but it was that really mattered. It was very tied to what the company did for a living. And so that was kind of one way to think about it. The other way to think about it was, so I told them all, I told these women my story about how I couldn't wait till we had enough money saved so that I could quit my job and do something that matters. And they each gave each other that look like, and if you have children, you know this look because teenagers give it to each other all the time. Uh, they're kind of rolling their eyes at you. But these women kind of all looked at each other like, oh, Lori hasn't gotten the memo yet. And they literally said to me, they said, so you're going to like quit your job and then go run a nonprofit and then go back to companies like yours to try and raise money. Like, huh? Why don't you just use what you do in corporate America to do something meaningful for a not-for-profit that you care about or some sort of cause that you care about. And that literally, I won't bore you with the whole story, but that literally led me to getting involved with a major 
cancer not for profit. I've been on the board for 20 years. Um, we we were a sponsor at Pepsi years ago. We sold, you know, we got vendor partners to buy tables. We raised Pepsi didn't give any money, but we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars um, through my efforts. And it was such a moment for me of like, oh, I don't have to quit my job to do something meaningful. I can actually think about the power and position that I have in my seat to do something meaningful. And these women got it. They're like, what are you going to do? You're going to have a bake sale. You're like drive around in your SUV in Connecticut trying to raise money. They're like, no, you're an executive at PepsiCo. You have power to do things for causes that matter. That day changed my life. Later, you know, when I worked for Cura Green Mountain, um, very, very environmentally focused company. And like many companies, they had the the plan where you could spend up to an hour a week, I think it was 50 hours a year uh, doing charitable work. And, you know, some people didn't do it, but it was another opportunity where you said, oh, whether it's cleaning, you know, cleaning rivers or painting houses, whatever you want, you can do that, you know, on the company's time. So anyway, so point number one was kind of legacy, thinking about what does the company do and how can I do something that's within the mission of the company that matters? Second thing was, I have a seat of power in this company. How can I use that to do something meaningful? And then the third area is what I'm doing now, which is, okay, I don't have to always, I mean, I'm 62 years old. I don't have to always work for a company where I get paid like a W-2 I have this wonderful portfolio career now. And part of that is executive coaching is very mission driven, but all the work that we do out of the band of sisters gives me so much joy that I can use my experience, my intellect, my power, my position, my contacts to try and dismantle gender bias in the workplace. So I think the whole notion of thinking about your life in multiple chapters it's okay when you're younger and you're, you know, you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to put away money to pay the mortgage, save for your kids' college, put away some money for retirement. In those days, it may just be that the way you get some sort of mission satisfaction is treating people well, knowing that when you do well for the company, you're helping other people make a living and have economic security for themselves and their family. When you treat people with dignity and respect, they go home having had a better day because they work for you. Like give yourself some grace, I think in your earlier years to say, that's mission driven. It's okay. Like it's okay that I was selling soda every day I showed up and tried to treat everyone that I worked with, with respect and dignity. And like I said, and help them earn a living for themselves and their family. That counts. It counts. Right. And so in the early years, it may be that later years, you might have some power and position that you can do more with it. You're president of a chain. Like I said, you might get to actually start a foundation, do something that's really legacy driven. And then at some point, if you've either had some lucky bounces or you did what we did, which is you found the joy of living slightly below your means, when you're in your 50s, you'll have some choices as to what you want to do in your life. And you can do things like the work we do as Band of Sisters that are really very, very um, kind of mission driven. And even though it's a commercial enterprise, it's really within the sweet spot of the value, my values and what I believe in. Yeah, I mean, that was such a comprehensive <laughs> way to approach it. I'm sure that people are appreciating that. And probably thinking, where can they hear more from you and be in touch with you? Uh, so where can they find you to get more information or get yeah. the book? Yeah, so they can uh, they can find the book, uh, You Should Smile More, How to Dismantle Gender Bias in the Workplace. Um, you can find it on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or uh, hopefully in your local bookstore or library. Um, and then the Band of Sisters, you can find me or the Band of Sisters on LinkedIn, and uh, you can follow us, engage with us. And, you know, we'd love to invite anyone to invite us to learn more or speak at your company. Okay. Do you have a website that you want to refer them to, or you prefer that they go to social media? Yeah. 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 I'll put it, I'll send it to you and put it in the show notes. Okay. All right. Um, 
Yes. All right. Um, yeah, the band of sisters.com is the website. I'm not trying to hide it. And yes, okay. we would love for people to go to our website, the band of sisters.com. Perfect. Lori, thank you so much for spending your time sharing your expertise, your wisdom and insights. Really appreciate you for being here. It was a delight. Thank you, Robin. Okay, everyone. And I'd love to hear your response to this episode. You can reach me. I'm on social media. I spend most of my time at LinkedIn though at Robin L. Owens, PhD, at Robin L. Owens, PhD. And uh, if you're the person I talked about earlier and you're looking for how can I add more meaning and purpose in the work that I do, I have a free resource for you at the podcast website, which is leadership leadershippurposepodcast.com, leadershippurposepodcast.com. And until next time, this is Dr. Robin. <laughs>